ready to jump into the word? Well, today we have a very special, I wouldn't say guest, because they are part of this family. They are, they, they're uh, alongside their husband, campus pastoring at our LA campus. Also, the firstborn daughter of our pastor, Pastor Marco. Can we give a big welcome to Pastor Abriana Villalobos? Come on, let's hear it. Let's give her a big welcome today. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you guys for being here and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I heard there's a woman in here who has nine kids. God bless you. Seriously, I have two and I'm like, I don't even know how you made it to church today. <laughs> That's wild. My husband literally, he's going to be mad I said this, but he's literally still at home trying to get to church with two kids. He's like, he won't let go of my leg. I don't know how to get ready. I was like, mm, welcome to my life. <laughs> so you guys know. <laughs> But today I get to give the word and I'm super excited about it. Um, this is the thing about God's word. God's word has the power to transform your life with like deep spiritual truth. But his word is simple that anyone can understand. So if you're here for the first time or you're here for the millionth time, this word is for you. And this, there's something in here that you can gain and that you can learn and that's going to equip you for your life and for your marriages and for challenges that you're going to face. And so we're going to get into this, but let's pray first. God, I just come before you and I thank you for today, God. I thank you for each and every person who made it to the house of God. Despite it being a holiday, God, they put you first. And so I thank you. Lord, and ask that you would just bless them, bless their day, let them have an amazing day, God. But I also ask that you would just equip us today to be like you, God, to learn about you and equip us to, to bring people to the Lord and to show people who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. So today we're going to be talking about, about a very simple subject, but it's actually, there's so much to it. And we're going to be talking about love. And I feel like love is so fitting for Mother's Day because how many of you guys know there is no love like your mama's love, right? When you're in trouble, who do you call? Jesus and mama, <laughs> right? If you need to bail out of jail, who do you call? Mom, I'm sorry, I did it again. <laughs> and who's, who's coming to bail you out? Mama, right? <laughs> mom's love is so unconditional. But where do moms get that love? from God. God is the author of love. The Bible says that God is love. So he is the embodiment of love. And this is something that um, I feel like there's some people in here who are just like born very loving and very kind. And just like, like my mom. Okay, I'll tell you. My mom, like for real, she's born like a little angel. Like she's, she's so loving and kind and patient and tolerant. And I'm just like the opposite. Like I was born the complete opposite. If you guys know my dad, I'm, I'm like him. Um, we're a little crazy. But so I, it took me a long time to like realize, okay, you need to grow and you need to love and you need to grow in your love. And so I remember if you ever ask my husband, you know, how do we meet or how we came to be, he always says in the beginning that he didn't even like me because I was just so mean. And I really was. I was so, I was so mean. Even as a Christian, grew up in church, I was just a mean person. Like I would just say whatever I wanted, you know, and just use it. Like, oh, that's, that's just, just how I am. I like to tell the truth. But it's like, okay, no. <laughs> you got to calm down. You got to be more like Jesus, reflect Jesus. And so this is what we're going to talk about today. And I also feel like I didn't fully, I, God has been, you know, growing me in love. And, but I feel like I didn't fully understand, like, how much God loves us. How many of you guys have ever thought about how God thinks about you? And maybe you thought, like, he was disappointed in you, even as a Christian, a lot of us. Um, and my whole life, I kind of just thought, like, I had this idea that God was just kind of disappointed in me. Like, you know, I'm not the best at what I should be doing, or I'm not always listening to him, or I'm not you know, the best Christian or whatever it was. And so when I had my son, that completely changed the way that I viewed the love of God because I feel like for the first time in my life, I finally understood like what love really is. These are my sons. <laughs> so the older one, he's four years old. He's Xander. And then the younger one is Zayden. Zayden is my patience tester. <laughs> he is a little wild child. Um, the other one is super sweet and charming, but they're both amazing. Um, but I feel like I didn't really understand the love of God, and that's also my husband, Gabriel. <laughs> um, I didn't understand it until I had him in my arms, and I was like, 
I will live for you. I will die for you. I will do anything in the world for you. And then God was like, look, this is how I see you. So when you mess up, when my four-year-old messes up, I don't throw him out of the house. <laughs> I'm not like, You're, I'm so disappointed in you. You just make terrible choices. All No, I don't. I'm like, it's okay. Come on. We got to learn. We got to grow. It's a, and I teach him, right? But I'm, I don't get angry at him or frustrated at him. And that's the same thing with God. God is not angry at you and he's not frustrated at you. And so we have to kind of shift our perspective on what love is, what unconditional real love is. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to read the dictionary definition and then I'm going to Also read the biblical definition, and we're going to see what the differences are. So what is love? Love is an intense feeling of deep affection, strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests. So there's two things that stick out to me that are contrary to the way that God loves. The first one is it says it's an intense feeling. So God's love is not necessarily based on feelings. It's more based on action and discipline, okay? And the other part that stood out to me was it said it's based on, based on admiration or benevolence or common interest. Okay, so what happens if I don't feel like I love you anymore? What happens if we lose common interest? Or what happens if me and you just think totally differently? Does that mean that I'm not supposed to love you? No, that's human love, okay? And so we're talking about what is actual love, what is God's love. And I think all of us have experience human love, which is faulted. It's not always consistent. It's not unconditional. When, you know, when you do something or your husband doesn't take out the trash, you're already, see, you never do this and you never do that. And I told you last week and then I had to take it out. You have pictures and it's like, come on, calm down. (laughs) So God's love is not like our love. Let's, let's take a look. And I want us to test ourselves. And especially if we are believers and we believe in God, This is something, even people who aren't Christians know that this is something that Christians are supposed to be. You're supposed to be loving. You're not supposed to be judgmental and critical and angry and impatient, right? And so let's just take a test. Maybe give yourself a score, one out of ten, okay? We're going to read this and let's see. Some of us, we're going to lose it on the first one. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Is anyone still here with me? Like, who is patient and kind? Okay, we're growing, right? We're growing. So love is patient. It's kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Let's say that again. Or rude. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. Some of you guys have a mile-long list of all the wrongs that your husband has done, all the wrongs that your sister has done. we got to rip it up and throw it away today, okay? It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So these are a lot of like never, always, um, endures through every circumstance. That's, it's crazy, right? Like it's hard to never give up right? It's hard to never lose faith. Like, how do you do that? And you can't do that if you're not depending on God, right? Um, And then the last part says, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but God, but love will last forever. So this is the, the most powerful force on planet earth is God's love. This is the only thing that's going to last forever. Um, So on that test, did anybody get a 10 out of 10? No? Okay, good. We have truth tellers in here. No liars in here. I did not get a 10 out of 10 for sure. But I think some of us um, also maybe are unaware and like not very self-aware sometimes. So you might need to ask, you know, your spouse or or your sibling, be like, what score would you give me? And you give yourself like an eight. You're like, ah, I'm pretty good. And your spouse is like, girl, you're a two. <laughs> Okay, we have to be honest with ourselves because some of us are the opposite of this list. We're um, impatient, we're unkind, we keep um, record of every wrong, we're proud, we're rude, we demand our own way, we're irritable, um, we rejoice about injustice. We're like, well, that's what she gets because she gave me that dirty look, so that's why she got jumped. So, oh well, she deserved it. Like, come on. <laughs> You're supposed to be literally a carrier of God's love. Um, so, I, I want us to constantly keep this in mind because we should be going through life with this at the forefront of our minds, at the forefront of every decision that we make, everything that we do, everything that we say is supposed to be done in love. And so we're going to get into three facts that the Bible teaches about love. 
So fact number one is love is the greatest commandment in the Bible and everything we do should be done in it. Matthew 22, 36 through 40 says, teacher, so they're talking to Jesus. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So number one is love God, right? A second is equally as important. So it's not kind of important. This is equally as important as loving God. Love your neighbors as yourself. It's equally as important. So if you're saying you love God, okay, well, how do you prove that? You love others. <laughs> and do you know that God's heart, if you would open God's heart, what is in God's heart? People. That's all God cares about. God cares about people. And so it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And isn't that the golden rule like in elementary school? This is where they get it from, you know, um, treat others how you want to be treated, right? And some of us still have trouble following that. <laughs> but it's, it's so simple, but it actually comes from the word of God. And it's not talking about your neighbor next door. It, I mean, it is talking about them, but it's also talking about the person you're sitting next to, the person at the grocery store, the person who messes up your order at Taco Bell. <laughs> love them. <laughs> Love them as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So everything in the Bible is based on these two things, loving God and loving people. And if you can learn to love God and learn to love people, you'll automatically start to do everything in the Bible because it all stems from your love for God. And so I want you to really, really grasp this because if you can get this, your life will be completely transformed. Your relationships will be completely transformed. Your mind will be completely transformed. Listen, when you love God, you, it, the Bible says, if you love me, you obey my commands. So when you love him, you automatically just have a desire to be more like him, to do things that please him. And so you just start doing things that are in the Bible you don't even know. <laughs> you know, you lose desire for the things of your old life and you gain desire for the things that God desires. And, and the other thing is when you love people, you don't want to hurt people. When you love people, you're not envious of them or jealous of them. You're, you actually are happy for them when, things, when good things happen. You're, um, you're not cussing them out. You're not having terrible relationships because you know that people are important to God, which means they're important to you. First Corinthians... 1614 says, let all you do be done in love. So what is all? All, another word, means everything. <laughs> everything, all, same thing. So everything, what does that mean? That means the way you speak to people. Are we speaking out of love? Or are we speaking out of, you know, anger or resentment or bitterness or even pride? Um, the way you treat your spouse, the way you treat your siblings, the way you serve. You know, some of you guys are serving with a battle attitude. <laughs> I remember I went, to, um, I went to a church actually recently, and there was an usher. And I was like, thank God this happened to me and not somebody else. Because somebody else would have been like, uh-uh, I'm leaving. <laughs> so this lady, like, she was, like, so rude. And I had already sat down and I had, you know, like, my kids and my stroller and just all kinds of stuff. We were in another state. And... Um, and they had, like, sat my family far away from me. And I was like, that's fine. Like, it's, it is what it is. Um, and so my family, like, they didn't realize because we were behind them. And so they realized, and they're like, oh. So they came to sit, like, a couple rows back with us. And then the lady goes and talks to my dad. And then um, she comes over. She's like, okay, come on. Let's go. And I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> she's like, let's move. We're moving over there. And I'm like, oh, you know, um, I'm, I actually, like, got out all my stuff already because I have my kids. I was like, it's fine. They, they can go. Um, I'll just stay here. And there was, like, a big pillar, and it was blocking, like, this huge speaker that they had. And my baby was asleep. So I was like, I'll just I'll stay here. It's fine. It's blocking, you know, the noise. And she's like, well, they already said you're moving. And I'm like, oh, it's because they didn't talk to me. You know, like, um, it's okay. Like, I'll, it's fine. They can move, though. I'll just I'll stay here with the kids. And she's like, but they said you're moving. And I'm like, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> I was like, and for me to get all of my stuff and move all, and I was just like, okay. Inside, I'm like, what is wrong with this lady, you know? But I'm like, okay, I had to keep a smile. I had to be like, you know what? I'm not going to start acting crazy like somebody else would. Like, this is an opportunity for me to show love, for me to be kind, for me to be patient. It's an opportunity to test my love, right? And there's going to be opportunities that your love is going to be tested. So how about we be prepared for those opportunities? Your kids, when you leave here, they're going to test your love. <laughs> Your husband, when you leave here, he's going to test your love. There's going to be the pe person in the drive-thru, the person in Sheath Cake Factory. They're going to have an attitude with you. What are you going to do? Like, they're going to mess up your order. Are you going to be upset and tell them off? No. 
let's take every opportunity to test our love and grow in it. Have you ever um, had somebody, like, give you a word from God? They're like, I have a word from God for you. And it's just, like, so unloving that you're like, was that even from God? Like, what was that? I've had that happen to me so many times. And, I, like, we have to really think about this. Like, when you're, especially when you're representing God to somebody, like, you can give people the wrong impression of who God is just by the words you say, how you go about them, how you say the words, um, the way you do things. That gives people the right um, impression of God or it can give people the wrong impression of God. First Corinthians, oh, actually, I was um, in Washington a few weeks ago and I seen these people on the side um, of the road and they had like all these picket signs and they were like, um, turn or burn, you're going to go to hell, LGBTQ is going to hell, like all this stuff, just like hate. And I was like, what do they think that they're going to accomplish with this? Like, do they really believe that telling people that they're going to go to hell and basically, like, God hates them is going to draw people closer to that God? No. Like, that is. And so some of us, though, we, like, go in and we're so religious and judgmental of people that we can't even lead them to God anymore. And it's so sad to see because everybody needs love like that this is what people are searching for everyone's born with this void in her heart and we're supposed to fill it with God we're supposed to fill it with his love first Corinthians 13 1 through 3 reminded me of these people um yeah these people crazy <laughs> um if I could speak in all the languages of the earth and of angels but did not love others I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal that's what they reminded me of they're obnoxious. What is a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal? It's obnoxious. It's in your face. It's like cringing, like you're cringing inside, like just stop it. Like this hurts my ears. And that's what people see when you try to present the gospel with actual hate. Like it's not in love. Um, it says, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I could understand all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. That's crazy. You are nothing without the love of God. You could do all of these things. You could be up here preaching. You could be on the worship team. You could be doing whatever, all these gifts. But literally it means nothing if you don't do it with love. It says, if I had such faith that I could move mountains. Okay. Uh, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others... It, I would have gained nothing. So without God's love, you're obnoxious, you're cringy, you're, you would be nothing, and you have gained nothing in this life. So you could go about your whole life and actually have done nothing and gained nothing, which is crazy. And, and, and I believe that there's a lot of people in church like this. Like, and this is where you meet people like this. You know, the Bible talks about, um, I don't have the scripture on here, but it talks about in the last days that people will be lovers of themselves, and the, but they'll deny the power that could actually make them godly. And so it's not talking about just um, people out in the world. No, it's talking about religious people, people in the church who think that they're right with God, and they think that they're so holy, and they think that they're so righteous, but it's like, no, you actually have denied the power, God's love. You have denied the power that could do anything in your life. So all of, you, all of everything that you've done literally meant nothing. Thing. And it's so sad to see that. And so we, as, as believers, have to make sure that we are not in that category, right? None of us want to be in that category at the end of the day where God's like, depart from me, I never knew you. And you're like, but I did all this stuff. And he's like, no, you didn't. You did that for yourself. You did that for your ego. You did that for your pride. <laughs> I've actually been seeing a lot of um, celebrities recently um, get saved. And this is something that I have noticed, and they're all kind of saying, like, the same thing. Um, is that they've been getting, you know, a lot of criticism and hate. But I want you guys, uh, we're going to take a look at a video in a second. But this is Kat Von D. Um, and if you don't know who she is, she's like a celebrity tattoo artist. Um, she's basically a witch. Um, she has, like, a Sephora brand um, in the makeup store. Um, and so she made two posts. She had one where she took a picture of all her witchcraft books and all her tarot cards and all this stuff, and she was throwing them out and burning them, and she was like, this is no longer a part of my life. And then she had a second post where she posted her baptism, and she was saying, like, I got saved, like, I love the Lord, I'm on fire for him, which is super awesome, right? And I'm glad you guys are clapping because this is something that, like, is super exciting. Like, can you imagine this girl, like, how much influence she has? And she's going to be able to bring so many people to Christ. But this was the response that she got. And so I want to take a look at this video for a second. 
I want to talk about like the response that I got to the video that I posted about my baptism. It was an overwhelmingly beautiful amount of just positivity and just love, but there was this other side of the response that was just so awful. And, you know, it's not, it wasn't my atheist friends. Um, you know, you would think that all the hate would be coming from people who are, you know, against religion or against Christianity and stuff. And it was really the Christians who were the worst. And there was, it was just really like sad to see like this critical display of judgment. Um, that isn't Christ-like, you know, to judge people or judge people's journey. It's like, um, you would think that that most Christians would be like happy for you when you, um, you know, come to this point in your life, especially when, when you get baptized. Like baptism is so beautiful and it's such a, a big landmark in, in time, for me at least, it was one of the most important days of my life. So like I said, I was expecting, you know, a lot of negativity coming from my existing fans and followers and friends. And um, although I got a little bit, it was not anything compared to the criticisms that I got from Christians. And isn't that crazy that she's literally saying not even her atheist friends are giving her a hard time. It's literally the Christians being haters, <laughs> like literally posting hate comments. Christians, she um, had an interview and she's like, I feel like I could literally see like demons like hissing at each other in my comments. And it was Christians, like <laughs> Christians, I will say Christians. You know, so if you're spending your time posting hate comments, I would really examine your life. Like, do you really love God? Because... That's not godly, That's not, that does not reflect Christ. And the world doesn't need to see more Christians like this who just reflect all the hate in the world that everybody already has. Like people need to see God and we're supposed to reflect God. The Bible says that people should know you, they should know that even you're his disciple by the way that you love one another. John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So the way you love should be so different than the world that it actually proves God. Isn't that crazy? The way you love, so if, if your love is just kind of like everybody else's, okay, well, we got to step it up. The way that I love people should actually be so different that it causes people to look to Jesus. And so, and I'm going to read the scripture also. This is about, you know, people who are haters, basically. <laughs> um, 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, they're a hater, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how could we love God whom we cannot see? So if you can't love the person sitting next to you, or there's a girl who comes to church and you used to not like her in the past, and now she's coming, she's like, why is she coming here? She's so fake. She shouldn't even be here. She didn't even, she didn't even like God. She doesn't even know God. I don't even know why she's here. I still see her comments. She's so post, she shouldn't be wearing that. Like, what, what is that? Like, worry about yourself. Worry about growing in love. Worry about, why don't you reach her? Why don't you put her on your discipleship group? What about that? <laughs> Number two fact. Love is sacrifice. And this is the thing as mothers we can definitely relate to. You know, you sacrifice your sleep. You sacrifice your time. You sacrifice changing dirty diapers. You sacrifice your body. <laughs> um, there's so many things that, you know, we do as mothers that are not necessarily what we want to do, but we do it for, for the best for our kids. And so this is what God's love is like, but even more. It goes beyond, you know, sleepless nights and changing diapers. John 15, 12 through 14 says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way. So not kind of like me. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. So this is Jesus. He's talking about what he's about to do on the cross. He's about to die for everybody, all the world's sins. He's about to take their place and die on the cross for our sins. But he's also um, saying this to show us what real love looks like. And it looks like laying down your life. And listen, I'm not saying you have to go die for somebody right now. But what I'm saying is sometimes we have to die to our selfish desires, to the things we want to do. Sometimes we have to lay down um, our likes and our dislikes. Sometimes we have to lay down some time for others. Maybe somebody needs prayer and you're like, mm, you know, I was going to go to the movies. But they're like really struggling and they're calling you crying and like, I need, I need prayer. This is going on in my marriage. And you're just like, oh, okay, well, maybe tomorrow. And it's like... 
is that movie more important than, than a soul being saved? Is that movie more important than God's will being done? Is that movie more important than their healing? No, it's not. And, but I think some of us, we kind of lose sight of this. And I'm not saying to, this to condemn us, but I'm saying this to like, let's wake up, you know, because we can do a better job at loving people. <laughs> we really can. And we really should. And this should be at the fore, forefront of every decision that we make. You know, some of us are, like, even offended that, like, someone asked us to serve on the altar team today. And it's like, well, I was planning on going to Cheesecake Factory after. And it's like, okay, your cheesecake can wait for 20 minutes. <laughs> like, is your cheesecake reservation worth a soul? Is it worth somebody finding healing and salvation and getting in a discipleship group and transforming their life? It's worth it. It is worth it. First John 3.16, it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up, gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. So he's saying this is what real love looks like. Giving up your life, giving up maybe your resources or your time or whatever is most important to you. Sometimes we need to give those things up in order to reach somebody. And this is the thing. We can't be led by what we love, but we should be led by what he loves. And what he loves is people. That's what he loves. And so that's why we have to be led by what he loves and his heart. Because obviously our hearts will lead us astray. Um, and then the third one. God's love is unchanging and unwavering. This is fact number three. Romans 8, 38 through 39. It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither uh, angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even all the powers in hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's saying, the love of God is literally the most powerful force on planet earth. And that's the love that you and I as Christians are supposed to carry within us. That's the love that transforms lives. That's the love that brings about salvation. Okay. And I think some of us sometimes, um, maybe you're in here for the first time or maybe you've, you know, been in church. And some of us think that our mistakes or the things that we've done change God's love for us. And so we're constantly like... Maybe some of us are constantly trying to, you know, work our way back and we're trying to fix things on our own. But it's like, no, God's love is always there and he's ready to forgive and ready to love you back to where he wants you to be. But I think sometimes we can't even forgive ourselves. You know, I remember when I was um, in that place where I was just so unloving, I was so, like, I hated myself. Like, I knew that I needed to change, but it's like, I actually don't know how. Like, I know that we're supposed to be loving, and I know that we're supposed to be kind, but I was just like, every opportunity, I'm just failing, 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 failing. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, why can't I be patient, and why can't I be kind? And so it led me, like, into a place where I was just, like, miserable, and I hated myself, and I hated the way that I would act, and I hated the way that I was. But guess what? God's love is what transformed me, and God's love is what changed me, and God's love is what I have today now <laughs> that I'm standing here. And so sometimes I say that to say, sometimes there's things that we feel like we can't even forgive ourselves for, but God can, and he will, and he's ready to forgive you. And there's a few people in the Bible that, you know, this reminds me of. These people, um, they were all used by God, but they were all messed up, jacked up people. <laughs> they were all, they all made huge mistakes. Not like little, you know, little, did a little backsliding. No, they made huge mistakes. Um, but God's love didn't change even though they did. And even though their heart turned from him in seasons, God was still there. And so the first person is David. King David, he loved God. But then he started making some crazy choices. He um, ended up sleeping with a married woman. And then he got her pregnant. And then he tried to cover it up. And he couldn't cover it up. So he had her, her husband murdered. Okay, this is a man of God. Okay? <laughs> Literally committed adultery, got her pregnant, murdered her husband. That's crazy, right? But he eventually turned back to God. He had a lot of consequences, but he turned back to God, and God's love was still there. And he is still called, in the Bible, the, the Bible talks about him as a man after God's own heart. How can this man be a man after God's own, own heart? Why? Because God transformed him. God changed him. It's God's love who does it. It's not ours. Jonah is another one. Jonah, he was a prophet of God, and God was like, hey, I need you to go tell these people a message. And he was like, nah, I'm not doing that. I do not want to do that. <laughs> he physically ran away from God. Like he tried to go 
as far as he could. And how many know we can't physically run away from God? But he tried. He failed. And he finally, God rerouted him, and he finally did it. And he was still mad. He was still like, God, just kill them. I hate all those people. Like, this is a prophet of God. Like, you're saying just kill the whole town. And God's like, no, I love them. We're going to be patient with them. We're going to be kind with them. And God was still patient and kind with Jonah. Peter, Peter is one of Jesus' closest disciples, okay? He was physically with Jesus for three years. And the day that they took Jesus um, to go to the cross, in front of Jesus, he cut somebody's ear off. Literally, like, still gangster. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, you've been <laughs> with Jesus physically for three years, and you cut off somebody's ear in front of Jesus? Like, what are you doing? Then, after that, he literally denies that he even knows Jesus three separate times. Denies that he knows him. I don't know Jesus. I don't know who that man is. And the last person is Paul. Paul was literally murdering Christians. So he didn't just like, oh, I don't like Christians. I don't like Jesus. No. He was seeking out Christians, murdering them, torturing them, imprisoning them before his encounter with God. And after his encounter with God, he went on to write more books in the Bible than any other author in the Bible. And so if God can use these people, why can't he use you? Why do we think that his love is too far to reach us? Why? It's not. And so I want us to shift our perspective on what real love is because sometimes we Maybe we um, never experienced, you know, real love, you know, from our mom or our dad or the people who were supposed to love us let us down. And so sometimes we will put that on God and say, well, I don't think that God's love is perfect because I've never seen perfect love. Allow him to show you. Allow him to show you today what perfect love actually looks like. The Bible says that he will never leave you or forsake you. So he's not like your mom. He's not like your boyfriend who left you. He's not like those people in your life who have let you down because their love is faulted, but God's love is not. Romans 2, 4 says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? So what are wonderful... Um, Kind, tolerant, and patient are attributes of God's love. So don't you see how loving God is towards you and he's patient with you and tolerant with you? Even when you're doing things that don't please him, he said, does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So he's, he's saying, I'm here waiting for you. I'm here with my love, with my arms outstretched towards you. No matter what you've done, I'm patient and I'm kind and I'm tolerant. And it's here to show you that there's something different. It's here to show you that you can be a new person. It's here to show you that I'm going to transform you into a new person if you would just allow my love in. And so today I really want to encourage you allow God's love in. Maybe this is your first time and you feel, um, man, what she's saying is the truth. That's what I need because all of us have that void in our heart and until we fill it with God, it's never going to go away. No no drug, no man, no woman, no nothing, no drink is ever going to fill that void. The only thing that will fill it is God. And so I encourage you today, respond to God. Show him that you're willing to allow his love in. Pastor Christian, can you come and close this out? Thank you guys. Come on, how many received that word today? Can we give Pastor Abriana a big round of applause if you received that word today? Please remain seated at this time. Please remain seated at this time. This is an opportunity to actually respond to this word now. You know, we don't leave a service without giving everybody a chance to actually respond and to say, you know, uh, that's me. She's talking to me. I know that there was a, a self-check we did, a little self-evaluation. Well, this is actually where the evaluation takes place. We have to evaluate where our heart is right now with God. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's standard. Now, when we sin, the Bible also says there's a price for sin. There's no, there's no such thing as a, a free, get out of jail free card. There's no, you don't just do sin and then get away with it. Sin is not free. And God loves us so much, though. He loves us so much, the Bible says, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That means God loves you so much that he was willing to send his perfect son to pay the price that you owed, to pay the price that I owed. For our sin. You and I have sinned. We all know that's true, right? 
we also recognize and acknowledge there's a price for sin. But it was because of love, because of God's love, that we can be forgiven of that sin, that we can be washed clean, and we can be given a brand new life. If you're dealing right now with pain, with addiction, with heartache, with a depression, with anxiety, if you're dealing with this disease called sin, I have good news for you. Jesus died to break the chains of sin that have been on your life. And he resurrected from the dead to defeat sin and death for all time, to give you a brand new beginning. So today I have a question for you. Are you ready to receive God's love? See, what good would today be if all we did was hear about God's love? This is not a check in and check out church. This is a time for you to really have a real, genuine encounter with the love of God. He loves you. If he didn't love you, why, why would you still be here? If he didn't love you, why would he be talking to you right now? He loves you. He loves you a lot, and you cannot convince me otherwise. He absolutely loves you. He still has a plan for your life. But I've messed up, I made too many mistakes, but he still loves you. I've fallen short one too many times. He still loves you. He has a plan for you. How do I know he loves you? He sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you can be free from the darkness and the pain and have a new beginning. That's how much he loves you. So today, if you want to receive that love, if you want to receive forgiveness, if you want to receive a new life, if you want to know for sure if you were to die today that you would not go to hell for your sin, but you'd go to heaven because Jesus died on the cross for your sin and you've received him as your Lord and as your Savior. So today, if you're ready to turn from your old life to receive God's love today and give your life completely to him, then I'm going to count to three. And whoever I'm talking to today and you're saying, that's me, what I want you to do, I want you to raise your hand boldly. And I know you're in front of all these people. Yes, Jesus died in front of all these people so that you can say, Jesus, I love you in front of all these people. And trust me, no one in here is going to see you raise your hand and throw stones at you and, and judge you, especially after today's word. We're going to love you. We're going to congratulate you. We're going to applaud you for the decision you're making today. So if you're ready to receive Jesus' love and be forgiven today, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. Look at all those hands. Hands, 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 hands there. Hand, all those four or five hands in the back. Six, all those hands in the back. Look at these hands over here. Those hands back there to my right. Let me see your hands. I see you. I'm so proud of you. I see you guys in the back. I see all of you guys in the back. I see you back row there. Come on, this is big. I see you guys. Can we do one more thing? Before anybody else leaves, I want us all to stand. And those that raised your hand, there's probably 30 of you, 40 of you maybe that raised your hand today. Each of you, I want you to do one more thing for me. Would you make your way out of your seat? And would you come up here to the front so that we can pray for you and congratulate you? Come on, church. This is not the time to judge. It's not, this is a time to applaud. This is a time to get excited. This is a time to cheer on with love. Come on, someone was excited. You gave your life to Jesus. Clap like this was your brother. Clap like this was your mother. Clap like this is your father. Clap like this is your son. Clap like this is your daughter. They're giving their life to Jesus today. Come on, let's give them a big round of applause as they make their way forward. Yes. Come on, there's still more coming. Let's keep clap. They're still coming, church. They're still coming, church. This is a big day. Who would have thought on Mother's Day that you would give your life to the Lord? It's a beautiful day. We're going to need more altar workers and discipleship group leaders, please. More altar workers and discipleship group leaders. We need at least 20 or 30 more. 20 or 30 more, please. So if that's, if you heard me and you're a DG leader, come forward, please. We could use your help. Just like Abriana said, hey, a soul is worth more than restaurant. <laughs> the restaurants are going to be open, but this soul right here, they're worth so much more. Aren't we so proud of every soul, every person that came forward today? Come up, come up, come up. 
Come on, if you're in my DG, I need you up here. I need your help. Thank you, Ryan. There's some gentlemen over here. I want to make sure everyone, well, someone, everybody has somebody. Thank you so much. We have some ladies over here too. I want to make sure. Some ladies over here too. Thank you so much. We have prayer workers coming. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, just come through. There's some more gentlemen right here and young lady right here too. Thank you so much. This is how much you guys matter to us. We're going to take our time here. Guys, church, let's never get used to this moment. Their eternity is shifting right now. We have, a, we have a lady here too as well. Lady too as well. Yeah, yeah, right here. Thank you so much. God bless you. We have a gentleman and a lady right here. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for responding to the call. This is, this is what it's all about right here this moment. For those that came forward really quick, just look at me for a second. We're going to help you grow in your walk. We're going to help you in your walk. We want Your next step is to get baptized. And what is baptism? It's like a, a declaration to the world that I'm dying to my old life and I'm, ra I'm, I'm raising up as a new person. Jesus is going to change your life and he's going to give you a whole, whole new way of living. And we're going to disciple you and walk with you and show you how to live out this walk with God. Okay, so the person in front of you, they're going to pray with you and they're going to sign you up for your next step. It's called Starting at the Way. And this class is going to help you take the next step. We're going to give you a devotional book, and we're going to just equip you with everything you need. All right, we're ready? Praise the Lord. We still have a few more, a few more people that need prayer. So just right here, and um, praise God. Raise your hand if you still need someone else to pray with you. I think, I think we're good. There's someone here, and then someone here. Okay, great. All right, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. You loved me enough that you gave your life so that I can live. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe you're coming back again. From this moment forward, my life belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and setting me free. From this moment forward, I'll, uh, I'll walk with your love everywhere I go. Teach me and build me, strengthen me and guide me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and setting me free. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say amen. Come on, let's give God one more shout of praise for what he's done. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us today.